Well, uh, I've realized that I didn't uh, introduce myself <laughs> completely, so, so I have to say something uh, or a little bit about, about me, myself. Uh, so I'm mainly uh, teaching. So I, I'm doing teaching uh, in my home university and uh, I teach uh, Haskell for, for about 10 years now. 10 or maybe 11 years, something like that. Um, and uh, I also work, I worked a lot in translation of uh, Haskell books to Russian language, so I work, work in Russia. Uh, so I, I'm not doing uh, GRC development by myself. So uh, my, my goal is different. So I, I want to study it and then I want to deliver this information to my students. So uh, I'm interested in, in functional programming, Haskell. I also uh, lecturing on uh, theory of computations, like complexity classes, computability, something like that. And I found out that it, there's, there are many connection points between Haskell programming and this theoretical stuff. So uh, it's, it, it's really, sometimes you, you think that it's the same thing, for example, in my theory of computation uh, classes, I use lambda calculus a lot, so I introduce it and I show how you can compute using lambda calculus or Turing machines or something like that. Uh, I also happen to be uh, Haskell 2020 language committee. So uh, it, it's unfortunately, it's a sort of mythical committee. So we have this committee, but uh, there is nothing we are doing there. So it's just a good page to say, well, I'm Haskell 2020 language committee and uh, I have nothing to do for that. So it's very, very, very convenient, you know, but I hope we have some time before 2020 to, to write uh, a new version of Haskell report, but maybe we'll not be able to do that. Nobody knows how to do that. Uh, all right. So, uh, yeah. And also, also, uh, uh, I'm writing a book on Haskell for mining, mining publica publications. Uh, it, it should be uh, released as part of mining early access program before this conference. Unfortunately, mining publications, they were slow enough not to release it before the conference, but it should be released like in, in a week or so. So Haskell in depth, it's, it's the title of, of this book. It's, uh, it's uh, Haskell language for uh, intermediate and upper intermediate Haskell programmer. So it's not a book for beginners, but yeah, you can check out this book shortly in mining early access program. So it's, they, they will release only three first chapters with uh, other chapters coming uh, during the development process. All right, so that, that, that was <laughs> introduction about me. And now let's, uh, let's go back to this workshop topic. Um, so we've stopped at this core, but we'll, we'll talk about core a lot. But now we have to finish this compilation pi pipeline. Remember that we've started with parsing Haskell uh, source code, then we've renamed every name there, then we've type checked it, then desugared and optimized into core, this uh, intermediate language, intermediate representation of uh, Haskell. Uh, and then there are several stages. Um, so uh, using this core, we have to prepare to code generation and uh, generate actual code. So uh, at this stage, there is a lot of processing. Like uh, for example, here you can see uh, so after this core tidy, uh, uh, you do something with this core in order to be able to uh, evaluate it efficiently. So if you know what is lambda calculus, and we will see actually uh, what is it uh, later in this workshop, uh, you'll see that there is a simple process of evaluating everything in, which is in the form of lambda calculus. Unfortunately, it's not very efficient. So if you use regular process for reducing lambda calculus expressions, it is very inefficient, in fact. So you have to do something differently. 
So uh, that's why we need all these LED constructions and everything else. So uh, in this preparation stage, we have to convert this lambda, this core into some normal form, which is good for generating code. And actually, there's a, a lot of things is, is done here. Uh, here you can see that this, this, this line is preparation for uh, interface files. They will be used for multi-module project compilation later because you, have, you need some information about module in order to compile another module in this project. Uh, then you're using here so-called uh, spineless tagless G machine. It's a special machine for evaluating uh, lambda calculus expressions efficiently. Uh, I'm not going to talk much about this, these stages, but they are very interesting, actually. It, 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 they have nothing uh, in common with type theory because everything is effectively untyped at this stage. Uh, or technically, we have some types, but they are more uh, close to hardware architecture and something like that. So uh, no, no more fancy types at, at this level. Uh, so this is this is this uh, uh, one of the uh, last stages, uh, and I, I will just show one fragment. So see, this is this is a fragment in this another intermediate language STG for spineless tagless G machine, and uh, it's the same example with our function f, which was which we're doing two two plus three, and you can see here some uh, uh, well. This, these things should remind you of something. For example, so here you can see uh, number three. That's three in two plus three. So here you can see number two. That's two in two plus three. So you see it, it, it's a little bit low level code. But still you have some type information here, like this one. Uh, and uh, here, you can see addition. So actually, you can read this two plus three in in this expression. But it's yeah, it, it's difficult to see that, but it's really two plus three. So this is how low level this STG code is. So, uh, but you need that to compile it. So later it will be compiled to something even uh, more low level. Uh, but still, it's it's two plus three. It's so-called saturated form. Saturated means uh, saturated with uh, some uh, information which is important for code generation here. All right, then uh, this is function main, which combines it. So here you can see it's again a STG code. So you are calling this print function for the saturated form, which, which was doing 2 plus 3. And then you get uh, your result. So by the way, you can see here the print is, so it's just from function, which comes from uh, this module, and then it will be run somewhere else. Uh, all right, and finally, we have code generation. It's the last stage of compilation. There are several possible outcomes for this generation. You can see them, them here. Uh, this STG code is actually uh, generated into C minus minus code. Uh, it's a very interesting programming language, another programming language in this pipeline. It is very close to C language, but it is it has um, explicit stack. So there is no stack. You have to you have to rule. Uh, you have to do everything with this stack by yourself. We'll, we'll see uh, one example of it. So uh, if you want to call a function, then you have to prepare a stack for it, and then you just go to, 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 to some position. So very low level. Actually, when you have GHC compiler, it's not just Haskell compiler. It's also C minus minus compiler. So if you have code in C minus minus, then you can f feed it into GHC and it will compile it for you. So it's not just C, it's C minus minus. Is it also like STG compiler so I can provide this? Yes, in fact, yes, you can do that. Although it's a little bit uh, difficult because for uh, as far as I know, uh, 
they don't have currently a parser for STG code. So maybe so you have you can do that, but you should you should use some uh, API for constructing STG expression. But for C minus minus, they have this parser, so you can just just give it, and then it will be compiled. So, so that means that basically STG that is generated, I can yes. It's only yeah. like to, to dump the, the, the right, right. Yeah, just to dump, just to see what is going on there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so. After this uh, C minus minus generation, you have several uh, uh, several options. So you can pretty print C code. So this will be just C language, and this is actually used in bootstrapping for uh, creating compiler for the platforms where there is no Haskell compiler. So you can compile Haskell into this C code, and then you can, can compile it to get stage zero compiler. I've talked about it before. Uh, you can also generate assembly code here as files, source files, just, just regular assembler for your uh, native architecture. Uh, there is also LLVM generation. So here this is uh, intermediate representation IR language for LLVM. So these are several options you can get uh, from your Haskell code. Uh, for example, here, uh, yeah, I think oh, it's, it's it's previous slide. Uh, so here is example of C minus minus code. So this is our stack. You can see that I was compiling it into 64 bits uh, architecture, Intel architecture, and this is uh, this management this stack. So we have like uh, offsets to some addresses. And you just put some information into so type information, construct information into several uh, the different uh, parts of this stack. Then, yeah, there. Where is um, uh, this? Is this is call to plus function? So you just prepare everything to to make a call to function plus. So that was the result of generating uh, C minus minus. So, so still you have, you have number three uh, and you have number two. These are two arguments. You see this difference between them. So it's, they are 16 bytes between them, two and three. And then, uh, well, I, I'm not sure what is it. It's it, it just something which uh, with uh, so, yeah, it, some pointers for that. I, I'm not sure exactly. Uh, Heap, heap, yeah, maybe, maybe it's something with heap, yeah. All right, but just, you still can see this 2 plus 3 in this, in this code. Uh, so these are several artifacts which you can get, actually, and it's sometimes very interesting to see what, what you can get. So I, I've talked uh, about them already. And then uh, in the rest of this part of, uh, of this talk, I'd like to say several words about uh, ways on how to extend your compiler. Remember, I told you that uh, GHC is a laboratory, actually. So it's not something which you can use as it is. So in fact, you can extend it in many ways. So you can, you can provide one part of a compiler written by yourself, and then you can use all other parts which are already ready for you. Okay, uh, so there are three main... Uh, ways to do that. So you can uh, use user-defined rewriting rules. I will say uh, something about that shortly. You can write compiler plugins and this, um, this feature was very, was extended in a very good way uh, last, um, well, I think a year ago. Uh, and then you can also use GHC as a library, not as a compiler as usually, but as a library and you can call uh, different uh, stages of compilation. You can type check something and then analyze the result of this type checking on your own. So as for writing rules, so this is just one example of a writing rule. You just say that uh, with uh, these types, you can replace expressions like that with expressions like that. You see, it's like an example of optimization, actually. Uh, I'm not going to talk about it, so 
just just imagine that there is a paper where, where, where someone proved, some, proved somehow that these, extension, these expressions are the same. And if they proved it outside the compiler, then you can add this rewriting rule, and then every uh, fold with uh, these expressions, every form like this, will be rewritten using this rule. So this rule is applied at the stage of optimizations. So uh, one, one of the, that iteration there will be this, exactly this writing rule. Uh, just one example, so the, the, there are many others uh, that you can use. In fact, this, this rule is already, GHC can, can already do that. So uh, you don't have to provide this rule by yourself. Uh, as for uh, plugins, uh, plugins, they, they, this is just one step. Yes, right. Will GHC warn me about uh, rules that are redundant? Uh, I, I don't think so. Warning. I don't think so. So it will, you can, in fact, you can even um, provide it with the wrong rule. I think. Oh, well, that's sure. But if there's right. a rule that GHC already has, it would be nice. You know, we have so many, in my, so many rules and partners and. and so yeah. I wonder if it's even possible that GHC could just say, you know, forget about all these inlines here, you know, I do it anyway, or forget about these rules. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. I think that in general it is undecidable to uh, realize that, uh, well, you know, it's, it's uh, from the point of view of uh, uh, computability theory, it's impossible to find out whether these two programs or expressions are actually evaluated to the same thing. So in general, it is impossible. So you can, uh, so you can have expression, well, if it's syntactically the same, then maybe it can realize that you're doing the same thing that was done already. If it's a little bit different, but it's doing the same thing, it's impossible for the compiler to see that. Uh, <laughs> right, <laughs> there is a paper. I don't know. Yeah, but yeah, I, I cannot comment on that. Uh, you know, can GHC figure out every problem? Then it, we don't need rules because it could figure out. So yeah, but I, I, I don't think that is in general it's possible. Right? Yeah. I bet we have tons of rules in our code that are just redundant. And right. Kind of I, I don't think, well, uh, I think uh, they, they use some heuristics there for deciding if, if they want to apply this or that. Okay. Uh, but if you provide your own, so if you ask to uh, use this rule, then it will use it and it will say nothing about whether it's a good idea or not. What about if the performance characteristics change over time? Is there any way to measure that each rule is giving a benefit to um, there, there are some limited uh, features for that, very limited. So in, in general, you just, um, you, you should do it by yourself. So um, you can... Uh, you just uh, introduce this optimization and then you run benchmarking and you see whether it's good or not. Good or not. So, but th th there are no uh, e easy, easy procedure for deciding whether it's a good uh, or not. So in general, these optimizations, I don't think that they are very formal there. So they just try to do something and if it works, then it, it's okay. But then it would be nice if there would be some so I don't think that they have they currently have that. Well, but again, it, it's a laboratory. You can you can yeah. try to do that by yourself. So you that's yourself very good. All right. Uh, Sorry, let, 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 let's continue with, with this. So, so this plugin is just, just one step, and you can write it, and you can do whatever you like uh, uh, inside, inside that plugin. And in fact, originally, these plugins worked only in this stage of uh, core-to-core -core transformation. Right now, uh, it is possible to inject these plugins in other 
components too. So you can write plugins for uh, type checker, I think for renamer and in other components too. So just to uh, change something and see what is going on after this, this change. And you also can specify where to apply this transformation. So it's, it's uh, quite a difficult mechanism. So sometimes it's easier to write a plugin than to work with GHC code base itself. And uh, it is uh, much more convenient. Can a plugin be distributed outside of Yeah, it just, uh, it just Haskell source code. So you can, you can uh, just put it in the directory with uh, your Haskell files, and then it's uh, just one flag to a compiler to, to use this plugin. That's it. Yes? But can the plugin use all GHC APIs, or it's some of Sure. It can, it can use everything, sure. Yeah. All right, uh, so the next step here is GHC as a library. So what, what you can do? So uh, these stages can be uh, executed by yourself. So you can do parsing, you just, just call to some function, parse this file, and then you get your uh, abstract syntax tree and you can do whatever you like with it. Uh, or you can just uh, write your own type checker for Haskell code. So you say to compiler, well, please do everything before type checking. Then you get the result that syntax tree with IDs uh, or, or with, with names. And then you do your own type checking. And then you fit, uh, fit what, you, what you get to other stages of the compiler. So just, just you can implement one step and use every other which is provided for you. So that's, that's basically a research. So if you're doing research in type checking, then you use everything which is not interesting for you from the GHC compiler, but you do something what is interesting by yourself. So this uh, GHC has very good API for that, so you can use it. And, and in fact, you can inject this compiler into your own application. And uh, so you can use everything uh, right uh, inside your own program. All right, uh, there is a book which I personally consider a very good book. Uh, it was written more than 30 years ago and it is distributed freely. You can download it. Uh, it's a book of Simon Peyton Jones, uh, Im The Implementation of Functional Programming Languages. As everything that was written by Simon Peyton Jones, it's, it is very, very readable. So uh, you can read about translation from uh, higher order functional programming languages into Lambda calculus. You can read there about how to evaluate these Lambda calculus expressions efficiently. And actually the, the first part is about translating into this Lambda calculus. The second part is about evaluation, and the fourth, third part is about uh, efficient evaluation. So everything that was written in this book 30 years ago is in fact used in the modern Haskell compiler. Some of the parts, of course, are outdated because th there were many papers after that. But I can assure you that every uh, Haskell developer once read this book uh, just to understand the most basic things. So it's, it's very good uh, start for uh, learning compiler, uh, GHC compiler actually. So you, you see there were no Haskell at that time. There were other programming languages like Miranda and ML was there and, and, and there are examples, many examples are for Miranda actually, no Haskell. There, there were no idea of Haskell when this book was written. All right, so uh, now uh, let's move to uh, Lambda Calculus. So uh, in fact, we don't need now, we, we can forget everything from the beginning of this workshop. Uh, so remember, type theory behind GHC internals is, is the title for this workshop, but uh, what is type theory? Let's, uh, let me introduce uh, type theory to you. Uh, so it starts from so-called untyped lambda calculus, which was uh, invented or 
discovered by George in 30s, 1930s, uh, very long, long time ago. Uh, I will use a presentation from the book uh, Types and Programming Languages by Benjamin Pierce. It's, it's like, uh, uh, if you are interested in type theory, this is a must-read book. It is also very good. Now, nowadays, we can we can uh, say that it's like ABC book for type theory. It is extremely basic. Uh, so if you see some uh, professional in type theory and you tell me, well, I've read uh, table, table, they say types and programming languages, say, oh, everything is wrong in that book. You know, it's heavily outdated. So their definitions are wrong. No, nobody uses it right now. That's for professionals. Of course, yeah, they, they've read the, the, the last paper from Principles of Programming Languages conference. They're not interested in that. But to start to understand what is going on, it is a very good book, actually. So I will use a presentation of uh, the first parts of type theory right following this book. All right, what is Lambda Calculus? Uh, in fact, uh, the, the most, uh, the simplest presentation is as follows. So we have syntax at first. So lambda calculus is some syntactical construction. And uh, what we have there, we have terms and values. So there are three kinds of terms. We have variables. We have abstractions, it's lambda abstractions, or we have, we have no other abstractions here, so every lambda abstraction is just abstraction. And we also have application. And as usually with uh, the definitions like that, if you have T here, then you can put everything like this or this in every position of this T. Very traditional, it it's actually goes back to Beckers-Nauer form, uh, very, very old stuff. Uh, so l lambda calculus technically is this one. So you can say uh, a definition of lambda terms like the follows. So what is a uh, set of lambda terms? Well, you say, well, every variable is lambda term. So if you have uh, some, some variable and some lambda term, then lambda x dot t is a lambda term. If you have two lambda terms, then this application will be a lambda term to its usual inductive definition, but it's much easier to understand them when we look at this notation. And also, we have values here. Values is something which cannot be evaluated further. This is a value. Uh, of course, when we have a lambda calculus, when we have these terms, our main idea is how to evaluate these terms. So we are talking about computation here. It's the simplest model of computation, actually. It was invented like model of computation, how to do things uh, in a simple way. Uh, so this is lambda calculus. And to evaluate it, you need some rules. So if you look at the papers or books in type theory, you see these, well, they say fractions. So if you see something like that, when they, they look like fractions. Uh, so in fact, they are rules. And here we define how to evaluate lambda terms. And as it is very instructive to follow, uh, at least from the very beginning, to follow these uh, rules in order to understand what do they mean. So there is very simple, uh, the, the, all of them, they have many simple meanings. and. Uh, it is very useful to understand that. For example, let's let's look at the first rule here. So uh, you know that T1 can be evaluated to T1 prime. So everything which is in the upper part of this fraction is what you have already. <coughs> so you know how to evaluate from T1 to T1 prime. Then you can evaluate uh, these two applications. So this application can be evaluated to this one. So if you have an application and you have a function in the left part of this application, then in order to evaluate application, you have to evaluate function first. 
So you start with evaluating left part of the uh, application. So, so, this is, so this is basically an algorithm for evaluation. So if you have uh, application, then please evaluate left part first to something. All right. Then you can see the second rule here. And it said that the left part of uh, application is already evaluated to the value. Again, value is something that cannot be evaluated further. So you apply first rule several times until it can be applied. Then you have values in the left part of the uh, application. And then you start evaluating its argument right here. So if you can evaluate argument somehow, then you can evaluate application with this argument. So this is an algorithm how to uh, evaluate any application. And then uh, and, and you can think about it as steps of algorithm of such evaluating. So you can implement it on your own. Uh, another rule for evaluation here is just uh, reduction. We call it in lambda calculus, they call it uh, beta reduction. But here, just, just, just one rule. So if you have uh, an application of this form, where the left part is uh, abstraction, and the right part is just some value, and that means that before applying this rule, you have to do all this stuff. So you have to get some value in the left part, some value in the right part, and then you can apply this rule. This is a substitution, so it just uh, replacing x's in this t12 uh, with uh, v2, so just an argument, and then you get something uh, like this. So it's it's result of applying substitution to this term. So this is all that we need for computing lambda calculus. And in fact, I'm not giving you a definition of this substitution. It's quite uh, difficult because it has to do something with names and there are many technical problems there. So it's not very interesting for us, but we'll see many examples of such fractions. And remember that always you, you need to read them in this way. So you have something that can be done in the upper part and then you can do something in the uh, lower part of this fraction. So that, that's basically what you need from that. And again, try to read these rules as an algorithm for doing things. So first, we, we, we see here, so first, if you have some uh, application, then we first apply first rule many times, then we apply second rule many times, and only then we can apply the third rule. So we have a uh, strict order, actually. And it's impossible to apply them in a different order, actually. Because you will uh, not satisfy uh, these limitations here. Like if you have value here, then it's impossible to apply this rule when it's not a value. So you have computed to the value first. All right, so it's evaluation or some, some say, say that it's operational semantics in this. Uh, uh, here it's the same thing in this context. Uh, then, if you want to work somehow with this lambda calculus, then you need some programming tools for that. So, uh, well, for example, you want to, to get uh, Boolean values and some operations over Boolean values like conjunction, dis disjunction, negation, something like that. Uh, you also need natural numbers uh, with addition or maybe multiplication, something like that. Because, well, technically you can do everything with lambda calculus itself. Because George, uh, Alonso George, proved that you can compute everything with lambda calculus without actually extending it. Because lambda calculus is equivalent to Turing machine. And according to the um, George Turing disease, Every computable function can be uh, actually computed with lambda calculus. We know that for sure if we believe in this uh, 
uh, church Turing thesis. But it, it's not very convenient. So you need these extensions. And you need data structures, of course. You need pairs, records, lists, something like that. Uh, and actually, when you need some, some extensions, you have two options. These two options are, you can either just code these new notions in lambda calculus. You can say, well, let false be lambda abstraction of x and then something else. Let true be something different. Then we can implement uh, negation as follows. So you can code all these things in lambda calculus itself. Or you can add new constructs. You say, well, OK, we have applications, we have abstractions, and then, then we also have Boolean constants, like true and false, and uh, natural numbers. And we can say we have constant for addition and something like that. And these two options, they always arise when you want to do something with your uh, language. You can either use this language and just code everything in it, or you can add new constructs. And the same thing, the same options you have when you develop your programming language. So if you have a Haskell and you want to implement something new in Haskell, then you can either add new construct for that or implement everything using what you already have. So if you have a Haskell source, Haskell source, then we know that it is converted into GHC core. Then when you want to add something to Haskell, you can either extend your GHC core and just translate it right to the core, or you can do nothing with your core, but just come up with a clever algorithm for translating this new thing into core. So this means if you don't modify core, then that means that you code new notion in this core. If you change core somehow, then you add new constructs to this core. So the same thing all the time. And we'll see later that some of the constructs, they were once extending the core. For example, generalized abstract data types, when they were implemented first time in Haskell, it was just extension to GHC core. But then they decided to remove it from core. And nowadays in core, we have nothing like generalized abstract data types because it is possible to encode it somehow in, in the core. So the same options all the time. Uh, all right, uh, so uh, in the repo, which uh, I, I was talking about in the very beginning, you have, uh, well, it's, it's not actually uh, exercises. So uh, if you've uh, cloned this wrapper, th there is an implementation of untyped lambda calculus there. And in this file, there are many uh, expressions in untyped lambda calculus. It is actually extended. Uh, this uh, quote, this implementation for unty untyped lambda calculus comes from uh, type and types and programming language book. In that book, all the implementations were done in ML, some uh, dialect of ML, uh, maybe OCaml. I think, yeah, I think it's OCaml. Um, but then uh, I've just taken uh, another re-implementation in Haskell. So there are all the credentials in the source code. They just borrowed it. Uh, so in this file, there are several uh, extensions, you can just run this code to see how they are translated, or you can add new expressions there. It's just programming in lambda calculus and type lambda calculus, a little bit extended with several constructs. Like they have Boolean numbers there, they have records there, they have uh, even floating point numbers there. So uh, you can see how, how things are going on. And you can also see how uh, this is implemented. So it's basic step for type lambda calculus. Uh, I, will, I will not uh, spend more time on that. So if uh, I think it's, it, it's better to have uh, this, to experiment with them well, during breaks or, or later. So yeah. 
but uh, just n n nothing. Well, I did not prepare just exercises. So just follow these examples in this file. You can try on your own, and, and that's it. All right. The next step for, uh, for us is going to simply type lambda calculus. So we need types, and we're talking about type theory in the end here. So uh, we need to extend this uh, lambda calculus with types. This was done also by, by Alonso George, a little bit later. It's the beginning of 40s, 1940s. So uh, STLC is the uh, usual name for that. And this, this lambda with arrow is the same thing in Greek. Uh, so what should we add? We, we add? we should add types for that. So let's see how we can do that. So in the book Types and Programming Languages, they use this uh, very useful thing. If they extend something, they just show it with pictures like that with gray background. So gray background means we're extending what we have before. So we had variables and we do nothing with variables. We had lambda abstractions as before, but we just add type information for every variable in, inside lambda abstraction. So that's very, very small extension here. Only this one. So we extend all the abstractions. Then we also have values and abstractions and values. And that means that we have to add this two here. Then types. Types will be only one type constructor, type for functions here. Uh, and then we also, we should add so-called context. It's just information about names. So if you have some term, then there are many variables, can be many variables there. Context is just something where you can keep your information about your uh, variables, about types of your variables in this expression. So this is simply typed lambda calculus. Uh, unfortunately, it's impossible to do something, to do anything with it. One problem with this simply typed lambda calculus is with these types. Can you construct just one type from it? Single type? T to T. What is T? T to T. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's, yeah, in order, in order to make a type, you have to provide this T, yeah, but you have no T, yeah? So, so it, it's impossible to program, to make even single term in this lambda calculus. Well, you can, you can, you can do that with variables only, with these variables, with this application, but it's impossible to create even single lambda abstraction here. So you have to extend it anyway. You have to add some primitive types and then when you have primitive type, they're like bool or net for naturals, something like that, then, then you can construct these function types and everything else. But uh, the definition of simply type lambda calculus is as simple as, as this. Just, just this, nothing more. But when you have it, then you have to review your evaluation rules, evaluation rules that we had for untyped lambda calculus. And this change is very, very small here. It's only last rule is changed because, well, we had lambda abstraction here, then we need uh, to add this type information right there. But nothing, uh, so we don't use this type information here. We just add it syntactically, but we do nothing with it. So evaluation has nothing to do with types. And that's a very important concept in Haskell itself. When you evaluate something, you don't need types. So these types can be removed or erased, they say. All right, but then, yes? That's true for the core, but that's not true for the type classes. We have no type classes in core. So here you don't need that, all that information. All right, but if you add types and you want to control it, why do we need types? Well, we want to check our expressions if they are correct from the point of view of types. So you need so-called typing rules. So we have to add all these typing rules. 
So there is a rule for typing variables, and it is very simple. If your contacts have some information, some information about variable x, then you can type this variable right here. So it's uh, it's rather it, it, it's simple rule. So if your contacts have has information about this variable, then you can type it. That's it. Not, nothing more here. Uh, if, if, if there is no such information about this variable in the context, then you cannot type it. You just you have uh, no information about it at all. Then, uh, if you, you can uh, assign types to the lambda abstraction, so this is a way for creating functions in Haskell. So if you have some variable of type T1 in the context, and in this context you have term T2 of type T2 here, then you can assign type for this lambda abstraction. It will be functional type from T1 to T2. So then you also need to type application. And in this application you say, okay, I have a term of this functional type. I also have a term for the an argument. And you see that you should, it's, they should correspond to each other. So T11 here and T11 here. And in this situation, you can uh, assign type to the application. So we have three kinds of lambda terms, variables, abstractions, and applications. And these are three rules for assigning types to them. And again, these rules, they are actually algorithms for uh, assigning type to the final expression. So you have this expression, and then you want to assign types to it. And you can uh, finally uh, get, get something. So, so you apply these rules many times until you are able to say, to find the type of your expression which you want to, to, to find out. All right, so very, very simple rules. And just, just read, if you have fraction, then you read the upper part of this fraction. And that's what you have. And lower part is what you want to prove using these typing rules. Uh, as, as I said, we can do nothing with this simply typed lambda calculus, or we can extend it with the same things. We can add basic types for bulls, naturals. We can add constants, operations for some of them. We can uh, add uh, this uh, conditional instructions like if the nails. And of course, if you add some type, then and add some operation that you have to extend your uh, syntax, you have to extend your typing rule, you have to extend your evaluation rules. So you have to do all that in order to make this system sound with all these extensions. For example, here, if you add true and type bool and true and false constants, then you say, well, Okay, value true, this constant will be of type bool. False will be of type bool too. And this is an example rule for typing if the nails construct. Interestingly, when you are talking about a uh, type system, <coughs> it is always limiting you somehow. So, for example, this last rule, it dictates <coughs> that two branches of if expression should have the same type. So technically, in untyped lambda calculus, there is no such limitation. You can say, if this value is true, then return this bool. Otherwise, you can return this natural number. Like in other programming languages without static type systems, you can do that. It's no problem. But if you introduce some type system, you limit yourself. So here we can see, well, T2 and T3 should have the same type T. And only then you can assign type to this expression with if, then, else. So these limits are going right from here, from these typing rules. So if you have natural numbers, you say, well, zero is a natural number. It's a rule for typing them. Uh, Successor, suck, it's the it, it, usual way for building numbers. So you start with zero, and then you have successor to some number. So successor to zero will be one, successor to successor to zero will be two, and uh, so on and so forth. 
So for it's just uh, usual encoding for natural numbers. Uh, then another predecessor here, typing rule. And again, you have this uh, limitation. So it's impossible to type expression with successor to something which is not a natural number. So this is again limited. You have to provide natural number in order to be able to type this expression with successor function. So everything is written right here. And is there another function which uh, uh, connects natural numbers with bools, for example? Again, you can call this function only for natural numbers, and the result will be bool uh, value. So everything is fixed in this type system. Uh, this is just an example of inference tree, uh, and uh, just just an attempt to uh, assign type to this value. So uh, so this is just difficult expression here, but we are able to find out that it should be bool result. Yes. This is a side note. This is sort of like the opposite way that. Normally, Sorry? This is like the opposite direction that you would normally think about. Like uh, yeah, so technically, if you want to type it, then, then you go from, from the bottom to, to the upper parts. So the idea normally is, so what is uh, <coughs> type checking? Type checking means uh, you have this expression and you, with, with type already, and you want to check if it's all right. If it's all right means that you can prove this type assignment. And proving means building this tree. So you go from the basic parts here, uh, here and here, and then, and then you go here. But so it's not type inference. If you are trying to type inference, then the processes will be a little bit different here. Yes? Um, again, for the people, mm -hmm. what, what does it mean? Is it the element of the symbol? You mean? Symbol? Yeah. Where it's coming from? Or what? This one, you mean? Yeah, how do I read it? Uh, say it again, please. Uh, uh, how do you read the tool? This, this element of symbol it comes a little bit of no, out of nowhere. Well, it, it comes from set theory. So our context is a set and... Uh, Which is element of itself here or how... No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Just, uh, just, just, just think about... So this is a context. X, okay. X dot bool. But context is actually a set of these pairs. Variable, variable and well, let's let's yeah, let's yeah. let's go back. Where where is the defi definition of context? Here is context. It's either empty yeah. set or set with added uh, pair. Okay. So it's both. We are not using in type theory. We are not using like curly braces for sets. So it's just one element set okay. there. Uh, okay. So we just abuse the there essentially. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so oh, we're yeah, doing yeah. it all the time. So, uh, okay, so it, it's just here we have a set of, set of okay. these elements, and here is just one element. Okay. Uh, all right, but that's the just, just an example how they do, uh, how they prove uh, such, such things here. Uh, but when it comes to the any type system, you have to prove some, prob some properties. Well, you know, uh, technically, uh, you don't need that. You can come up with a type system which is basically wrong. <laughs> and technically, there is nothing bad with it. So if you can live with that, then it's OK. Uh, but sometimes you need some properties to have guarantees of something. So if you need that guarantees, then you need to prove something about your type system. You want it to have special properties. So every type system, in order to be correct, so actually properties is just one, one possible way to say what does it mean to be correct. Well, correct means it should have some properties. So for type systems, one of the most important properties is safety. So in general, safety uh, means, well, it will be safe to compute this expression. But again, what is safe? In type theory, safety means progress and preservation. These are two properties of almost any type system which are useful. So here's their definitions. Yes? I'm sorry, but I'm still trying to that example. 
from the previous slide. Could All right. Quick, okay. Could you explain from the beginning, beginning what's going on? Why the, the, the context actually we start with context with X having a type of Boolean? Uh, all right, so uh, let, let, let's see it here. So uh, this is a set which contains one pair. Okay. This, is, this is a pair which belongs to this set. So what, like, what's, the, what's this process here actually? actually well, let's, 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 let's go back even, even further. Let's, let's see this uh, typing rule for variable. If this pair belongs to this context, then in this context, this variable has this type. So we are using exactly this rule here. Yeah, I, I've seen the rule. And now, I'm, now I have a problem. Like, yep. Where do we start from? from the, the up? Normally we start like from if we have this, then that, right? Like, right. Well, so in that example. OK. Uh, let's, let's, let's do it in this way. Uh, uh, no. So when you have a proof, technically, it doesn't matter how you've got this proof. Okay. So, so if you have a proof, you can check it, and you can go from top to the bottom, and then you see that every part of this tree is actually correct typing rule. For example, this is really correct typing rule which with name tvar for typing variables. If some pair x uh, colon type belongs to this context, then in this context, this variable has this type. Okay. Then uh, you use this for typing this expression, lambda expression. It's, it's another rule. So you have x of this type, and this is uh, a term inside this lambda abstraction, and you use this, uh, this uh, derivation here. So if it's bool, so it's bool here, it is bool there, and that's why it's functional type from bool to bool. It's just, just one instantiation of the T apps rule. So you just check. So you, 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 you look at the typing rule, and you look at this part, and you see that it's just saying the same. No, I see how each step is right. aligned with the rule. Right. right. Up here on my slide. So if you, want, if you want to build this rule, Maybe the other, I would just get a question the other way around. We are trying to prove that the thing on the bottom was the type of it, right? Yes. 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 Okay. So our, our goal is to type check the something. The is our assumption that, that X will get this in this context. I thought it starting with this assumption. 